Hello everyone and welcome to our New Works Composer Sessions as part of the Digital Discovery Festival. My name is Allison Loggins Hull. I am a flutist and a composer and I'm also a member of the National Sawdust Ensemble. So I'm extremely happy to be with, here, be with you all today and super excited to introduce Pamela Z, the one and only, and her presentation on the topic of crossing disciplines and working as an extremely hyphenated artist. She describes her session in the following way. Through video and audio examples and a bit of live demonstration, composer performer and interdisciplinary artist Pamela Z will share her work and her process and will discuss the increasingly blurred lines between disciplines in her practice, highlighting her use of voice, processing, gesture-based MIDI controllers and video, plus her integration of sampled speech sounds with chamber music composition. In her presentation, she will illustrate the various directions her work has taken over the years and give a live performance demo. A little bit more about Pamela, a composer, performer, and media artist making works for voice, electronic processing, samples, gesture activated MIDI controllers and video. Her work has been presented internationally at venues and exhibitions, including Bang on a Can, the Japan Interlink Festival, Other Minds, the Venice Biennale, and the Dakar Biennale. Her awards include the Rome Prize, United States Artists, the Guggenheim, Doris Duke Artist Impact Award, Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, and the Herb Alpert Award. I'm extremely excited for this today. I hope you guys are too. Um, so now, without further ado, I'm going to welcome Pamela to join us and get things started. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you all for attending. I'm Delighted at this opportunity to share some of my work and details about my practice with such an extraordinary group of composers. Um, it's challenging when people ask me how I should be classified as an artist. Early in my career, I think it would have been accurate to simply describe me as a musician. But over time, I've, breached, I, I've branched out in a lot of different directions. And so that the answer starts to become composer performer slash sound artist slash installation artist slash video maker slash experimental intermediate performance artist and so on. Um, when I go into restaurants, I always want to order the combination plate because I can never make up my mind what I want to have. So I really just want to try everything. And that also seems to be how it works with my artistic practice. The work that I'm best known for involves compositions for my own solo voice with live electronics that I often manipulate with wireless gesture control instruments. Um, I do live sampling of my, my own voice um, in real time to create layered performance works that are sometimes rhythmic, sometimes more abstract in nature. Um, and just to give you a little taste, I'm just going to play for you a, a short collage of, um, of excerpts from performances that I've done over the years.
Exchanging polite greetings and talking about your country where you live now, talking about your family members, visiting Japanese friends or acquaintances. When I first started doing this kind of work, um, my pieces tended to be short, almost pop song length, like four to seven minute little works that I would do. Uh, I'd perform as kind of a suite to make a concert. But over the years, I became enamored of multimedia, experimental theater, and performance works and began wanting to work in longer forms. So I started making full evening length pieces, complete with lighting and set design, and often making multiple um, use of multiple channels of, of projected image. I would choose a very large general subject to build the work around and then create little sequences or segments like vignettes that um, I would hold together with little things like projected image or fixed media text sound collages as, as a kind of a glue. I deliberately chose very broad open-ended ideas so that I'd be free to go anywhere in exploring them. Um, In, uh, in the 90s, I made a work about language called Parts of Speech, which took the shape of a sound work and then a performance installation, um, a performance work and an installation. Um, and then I made one called Gaijin in 2001 about the concept of being a foreigner in the place where you live. You actually saw a little excerpt from that in the first work sample that I showed. And that piece involved myself and three Butoh dancers, Shinichi Iova Koga, Kinji Hayashi, and Lee Evans. Um, I made a number of other large-scale performance works after that. 
Um, and then in 2010, I made one called Baggage Allowance. And Baggage Allowance was sort of exploring, exploring the concept of baggage in both literal and metaphorical senses. It was the most ambitious work I had made to date because it included a full evening performance work, a gallery exhibition with sound and video embedded in objects, and I even created a browser-based installation, which is still available to be viewed online at baggageallowance.tv. Although it doesn't work very well on your iOS devices because it's based mainly in Flash programming. Um, and as some of you may know, Flash is kind of going away on the internet. So the piece may not be viewable for much longer, but for now, you can still visit it on your laptop or desktop machines as long as your browser still has the Flash plugin installed. Um, here's just a few short excerpts from the San Francisco and New York premieres of the performance version of the piece. Maybe another jacket, a vest. I usually always have a vest. Either warm or wet clothing. One or two pair of blue jeans folded, and sometimes a pair of pajamas. One or two skirts. One pair of dress pants. One pair of jeans. Maybe one sexy nighty, depending on what's going to happen. Socks. Uh, and socks. 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 Just enough socks and underwear. I almost forgot the socks. And then this is some documentation from the installation, mostly taken from my exhibition at the Cranart Museum in Illinois, although I've shown the full installation and parts of it at um, other various galleries since then. The installation had seven pieces, mostly involving objects with sound and video embedded. And they were bag x-ray, weeping steamer trunk, suitcase, Holly's patent, a single channel baggage allowance video, sonic suitcases, and tape loops. 
So as the visitor entered the gallery, they would be confronted by the bag x-ray. And I had actually designed this so that they could put their bag on the belt. And then um, I had actual images that would be superimposed on their bag. So as they uh, looked at the, at the screen where the sort of x-ray image of their bag was, they'd see unexpected things. I had created a whole database of objects that might be inserted. And those were ranging from um, all kinds of things such as like weapons and um, maybe like some tools. There was even like a, a chest x-ray with a, with a um, beating heart, um, an Emmy Award, some live animals. Um, and, and all these things were just inserted in randomly into their bags. It was sort of selected by the computer according to the size of their bag to make the objects kind of size appropriate. And then I had another piece that was called the Weeping Steamer Trunk. And this was built, um, I actually installed sensors in the drawers of an old antique wardrobe trunk, uh, like the kind that people used to actually carry with them on ships when they would travel. And it's beyond me how people could travel with these things because they were really like furniture. They, were <laughs> they weighed like 100, well this one I think weighed like 75 pounds, empty. Um, but what I did was I embedded um, a, a display and speakers inside the, the lid of the trunk and then I had sensors in the drawers. So when they opened the drawers they would hear various um, sounds and also see various images in the lid of the trunk. Also, there were actual objects inside the drawers of the trunk, including uh, everything from just like a pair of gloves and a locket to stranger things like a tiny little model of a Victrola um, that was in, inside of one of the drawers. You can see actually there's the little teeny Victrola. And when they opened that particular drawer, they would get the sound of like vinyl surface noise from a record. Um, this drawer was filled completely with hair, and that was the drawer that the trunk actually would weep when, when you opened it. Um, there was a drawer full of just old family photographs and quite a few other things. It was tricky to get the visitors to actually uh, open and close the drawers because people are trained in museums not to touch things. So I had signage, but people had to be really encouraged before they were you know, brave enough to actually touch the object and open and close the drawers. Um, and then probably my favorite piece in the exhibition was a piece called Suitcase, which I've shown on its own in a, a bunch of different galleries um, since then. Uh, this piece was maybe one of the more simple in terms of technically how it functioned, it, uh, but it was also seemingly the most affecting. People would get kind of emotional about this piece. I don't know why. They would either find it very charming or sometimes kind of creepy. And I think the creepiness factor is probably related a lot to the to the scale because they would see this very small suitcase only like 24 inches wide and yet when they look inside there's an adult woman curled up inside the, the suitcase sleeping and there's also a sonic element when they get close they can actually hear my voice sort of muttering and whispering all those frantic thoughts that you have when you're trying to get to sleep um, and once in a while they would get close and then she would look right at them which startled people <laughs> quite a bit um, so in 2007, I was commissioned to make a video and sound installation for a new media gallery called Recombinant Media Labs in San Francisco. Um, and this piece, uh, it was in a, an immersive, a very immersive setup in a room that was 24 feet by 36 feet with 10 frame locked channels of video projected on 12 foot wide HD screens mounted edge to edge with three screens on the sides of the room and two on each of the ends of the room and 16 channels of surround audio. I wanted to make something that was site specific to the room so I created a piece called Sonic Gestures using video of gestures associated with sound. It was on an 18 minute loop with four sections including one with extremely time stretched hand claps and another with long gestures, sometimes resulting in a 36 foot long arm reaching across three screens. And there was this fragmented kind of chattery section featuring my 2007 not very smart phone. <laughs> And then I, for some reason, I made this crazy section called the long URL. H-T-T-P colon.
slash slash www dot due to high call volume underscore extremely long ampersand dash carrot dash stick equals you might want to write this down comma all one word plus sideways frowny face colon open parentheses unknown character comma triple forte forward slash at symbol carrot greater than remote debugger connection and of course that text that you're hearing was whipping around more and more rapidly around the heads of the viewers throughout the gallery through these, these surround speakers in the system After the showing at Recombinant Media Labs, the piece went kind of dormant for several years because there wasn't really any gallery equipped to show the work. Um, but in recent years, the technology's kind of caught up and it's become possible to rejigger the piece so that it can be served from a single computer. Last year, Sonic Gestures was shown in two galleries in Europe, Trondheim Elektroniske Kunstcenter in Norway and Savvy Contemporary in Berlin. On another trajectory, in recent years, I've received a fair number of commissions from chamber ensembles. And as a result, I've composed quite a few chamber works, some composed for a chamber ensemble plus my voice and electronics, some for just the ensemble to play acoustically, and most involving some sort of electronics, whether it be live processing that I do on the ensemble themselves or a fixed media part that they play along with. Often when I start a new work, whether it's a chamber work, a sound work, or a solo performance piece, the first thing I do is record interviews with a number of people. And then I use that interview material both as inspiration for making the work and as actual material that I use to compose the music. One example is a 2012 work I composed for Kronos Quartet, which was written for string quartet and tape, as we still like to call it. The piece was about speaking accents specifically accented English. So I interviewed people with, from many different regions of the US, um, from other English speaking countries, and people who spoke English as a second language. The tape part was composed of fragments of their speech and much more um, uh, uh, of the melodic and harmonic material in the string parts was derived from the pitches and rhythms um, in, the, in the language that was spoken by those people. Um, so I'm just going to show you a short excerpt or just play for you a short excerpt of the first movement of the piece. Um, and uh, this is just audio, actually, um, of Kronos uh, from the live recording of the premiere. Born. Born. I was born. I was born. Born. I was born. I was born. I was born. I was born in Ireland. I was born in Ireland. I was born in Ireland. I was born in Japan. I was born in Japan. I was born in South Africa. I was born in Fort Smith, Ark and West, Australia. I was born in Sydney, Cold and Chin. I was born in Paris. My father was a lawyer. I was born in Houston, Texas. Long Island. I was born in a very, very small little town or village almost in South Sweden called Laholm. Called Laholm. Called Laholm. Called Laholm. Called Laholm. And another string quartet that I composed was commissioned by a group called Del Sol Quartet in 2016. It's called Attention. I composed it for string quartet and uh, mobile devices and a fixed media part that was not just audio, but actually incorporates a video that I made. And in places, 
like at the opening and the closing of the piece, the video actually serves as a graphic score for the quartet. In this piece, I was thinking about the ways in which our focus and attention are constantly challenged by endless notifications and nonstop communication feeds. And the piece requires that the quartet make their way through the score in the face of a series of mounting interruptions. are forced to split their attention, navigating distractions and, and also distracting one another as they multitask their way through the piece. In the premiere, I made use of the Exploratorium's Meyer Constellation sound system to deliver beeps and bloops and text alerts and notification tones throughout the house. So that at times the audience members feared that the sounds might be coming from their own devices. In this section, the violist actually receives a text message indicating that there's a change in the score. And there's even a section in which the cellist's phone starts ringing and she actually decides to take the call while trying to continue playing her part. Throughout my career, I've composed a lot of scores for dance and film. I've, co I've been commissioned by many choreographers over the years, including uh, people like Joe Kreider, whose company Fly Away Productions is known for very athletic kind of aerial dance that Joe refers to as apparatus-based apparatus dance. And Mary Armentrout, who's an experimental choreographer who makes performance installations that often actively involve the audience. In 2011, I was commissioned by Brenda Way, the artistic director of ODC Dance, to score a piece for her company. In this score, um, I make a lot of use of two devices that I'm very fond of in my work, found text and alphabetized lists. I've always loved lists, especially alphabetized ones. I find them to be tremendously poetic because of the sonic properties and the kind of repetition of gradual morphing that occurs within them. It's a bit like rhyme, but in my opinion, it's actually better than rhyme because it's less predictable. Brenda made a substantial 25-minute piece called Waving Not Drowning, for which I composed a lot of new music, and uh, the score also used a little of my existing work, including my found text piece, Pop Titles You. 
Here's uh, just a few short excerpts from Waving Not Drowning. La lingerie, les lunettes, le luxe, le maquillage, les mannequins, les manteaux, les maris, la mode de parfum, la personnalité, la photographie, la place, la planification. stand out. You, you, you started laughing. You, you started me dreaming. You, you started something. You, you started something. You, you, you stayed away too long. You stayed on my mind. You stepped into my life. You stopped loving me. You sure got this old redneck feeling blue. You sure know how to party. You sure know how to use the things you use. You sure love to ball. You sure make cheating seem easy. You You sure tell it like it is, George Jones. You You take a little bit of it home. You You take me for granted. Cocktails. Color. Comfort. Daughters. Dinners. Discretion. Dresses. Earrings. Expecting. Fashion, figures, funerals, gadgets, gestures, girlfriends, glasses, gloves, grooming, hair. Just over a year ago, I moved to Rome. I was a recipient of the Rome Prize in Music Composition, and I went there to begin my fellowship year. The project I was going to work on there was a performance work called Simultaneous, exploring ideas around synchronicity and simultaneity. I started the work, as I often do, by conducting a lot of interviews and attempting to interview all the other Rome Prize fellows, as well as some residents and some staff. My Rome Prize Fellowship year was cut in half by the COVID outbreak, and I wasn't able to finish my project while I was there. But I did manage to create an installation work, um, a piece called Sonora Spolia, using speech fragments from the interview material. I installed 21 speakers in the Crypto Porticus of the American Academy in Rome. And I created a spatialized immersive sound work for the Academy's annual Cinque Mostre exhibition. Different layers uh, overlapping. Um, Different layers. um, So different different layers. layers. Uh, um, Different mm -hmm. layers. Different different layers layers, uh, overlapping. overlapping. Um, Significant overlap very much overlapping different layers very very much overlapping different Different layers layers. different layers and uh, so uh so Uh, so 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 strange so and so so strange so so so, so usually, um, uh, um, and uh, she and I realized that we were both wearing the same in that moment, like the same exact pair of flannel pajamas with penguins on them. Uh, um, 
I had a dream about a very dear friend who amico, I don't speak to very often. Non parlo molto spesso. So um, I thought that I would conclude my presentation um, by just playing for you a little bit live so that you can see some of my live performance tools and how I work with them. And then afterwards, uh, we'll have some time for a few questions. Oh, 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 oh,
So I think at this point, um, I am going to turn it back over so that we can move into questions and answers. Wow. Thank you so much, Pamela Z. Um, mesmerizing, so inspiring. Just, I don't know, I'm so, so thrilled. I feel like this is exactly what <laughs> we needed today. Um, so yes, we're going to move on to a question and answer session uh, with uh, some of our composers. The first one being Jesse Cox. Um, Jesse Cox, you can get ready to join us and I'll introduce you. Uh, Jesse is a composer, drummer, educator, and scholar in pursuit of his doctorate degree at Columbia University. He is currently residing in New York City and his roots are in Switzerland and Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome, Jesse. What's your question? I thank you so much for the wonderful performance and presentations, very inspiring. And um, my question is sort of, uh, I guess, a question also asking from my perspective as a younger composer, um, as some tips that you might could share with me uh, or us is how did you maybe deal with the idea of skill or maybe research when you, you know, cross in so many Cross so many boundaries and uh, especially into maybe personally yet not as much explored disciplines, how you would go about such uh, such things, such moments in your work. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, so that is a, a curious question because I know it's always, a lot of times I think people can be suspect of artists who were known for one thing and then all of a sudden they're doing something else. You know, people see that somebody like David Byrne now has a visual art exhibition at MoMA or, you know, and they're like, how does that happen? How does a person skip from being this to this? Um, and actually, I think um, a lot of these people, this other new direction was already nascent in them at the time you know, by the time that they started expressing it publicly. And so in my case, um, I think a lot of the things that I have sort of moved into, it was a sort of a gradual move and it more, it happened kind of organically. It wasn't like I woke up one morning and said, oh, I want to be an architect, so I'm going to design a building today, even though I've never studied architecture and don't know anything about it. Um, it would be more like... Um, well, for example, I'll talk about the, the, my slipping into using video in my work. Um, the first piece that I made that I considered a serious work that was involving video that I created, because up until that point, when I needed video in my work, I would actually um, talk to uh, other artists who I know that whose work I really respect and collaborate with them and have them make the video for me. But um, the first work that I made was one of those happy accidents, which um, come up a lot in my work where I'm trying to do something and because I don't know how to do it, something else happens and that ends up being more interesting than what I was trying to do. Um, and in this case, it was, um, I had made an installation, um, sound installation in my studio at an artist residency that I was at. And I wanted to document it because I had to tear it down because we were all leaving, the residency was over. So I borrowed a camera, and this is back in the days when, um, this was before 
smartphones or any of that. Um, but I borrowed a, a what at that time was a high-end video camera from the residency program that I was at. And I was just shooting a lot of video of this installation in my studio. And um, what I, I, real, I didn't realize it until I started to edit the video, that what I had done was I treated the video camera like it was a still camera. And I was just turning it like, oh, this is, you know, I, this would be a nice wide shot. This would be a nice, you know, portrait style. And I was moving the camera without realizing that you can't really do that if you're filming. <laughs> and so, and so I, I then, you know, started to edit the video and I realized that I had these two different orientations in my video. So I decided I would just edit all of the video that was tall in one channel and then edit all the video that was wide in another channel. And I ended up creating an installation piece, which I then displayed on monitors. And at, again, at the time, we didn't have all these flat displays that we have. What people were showing video work on was these big, heavy CRT monitors that are as deep as they are wide because they have tubes in them. And so I borrowed two large monitors from the residency program. I took one, turned it on its side and strapped it with that nylon strapping uh, tape, that stuff that you use to cinch down things onto the back of a truck or whatever, put it down so that it was on this, against this like AV cart standing up on end like this. And then the other one wide. And then I made this sort of two channel video installation using the footage from my documentation. And so I just sort of stumbled into making a video installation that was largely because of my not knowing what I was doing that I had made a mistake. And so I find that uh, that happens to me a lot is that I just, I get in, uh, you know, I, I wasn't trying to make video work. I was actually just trying to document my work, but then I sort of stumbled into something that was interesting for me. And then of course I started working with video a lot more. And it wasn't until many years later that I was, I felt that I had the competency in working in video that I could make, make, make video works that were really well made. But that just came from the doing of it. Um, so I don't know, it's, it, it's a little bit of a, a wonky answer, but that's kind of how it works for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful answer. I think it's very uh, helpful and inspiring to hear to hear how it works for you. Worked for you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you for your question, Jesse. Uh, next, we have another composer, Yaz Lancaster, and I'll invite them to join us now while I introduce. Yaz is an interdisciplinary artist committed to supporting marginalized identities genuine modes of collaboration and practices aligned with relational aesthetics. They hold degrees in violin and poetry from New York University. So please welcome Yes. Hi, thanks nice so much for you, your- Yes. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Thanks so much for your presentation, it's really great. Um, so my question is sort of similar to Jesse's question. Um, so as someone who is also interested in different mediums and disciplines, um, I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to present yourself in your work to presenters and panels or like in grant writing. Um, I sometimes feel that maybe people are looking for like a specific thing or a program uses specific language um, to describe what they're looking for, which makes me feel like I need to describe myself in a certain way. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, well, I think it's a combination of things. I think um, that... Uh, a lot, you're right that a lot of foundations have very specific bent and they, there's something that they are looking for that they have in mind. And um, I, I'm really opposed to making, making work to satisfy what you think somebody else wants, but I'm not opposed to looking for ways to spin how you're talking about it to where it will open the ears of somebody who maybe, you know, was, is listening in a very particular way. And, um, I, one example of that, I, I, I know is that, um, there's a, there's very good individual arts funding in the San Francisco Bay area, which I think is kind of unique to hear. Um, a, a lot of places don't have the luxury of having foundations that are, 
doing a lot of funding that goes to the artists instead of to arts organizations. But in, in San Francisco, the San Francisco Art Commission has a program that's specifically for individual artists. And um, for many years, they split it up by discipline. And so uh, it, you could only... It, you could only apply every other year because one year it would be for music, theater, and dance or something. And then the next year it would be for media, art, film, and video, you know, something like that. They, I can't remember what, how they split it up, but they split all the disciplines in half and sort of like only every other year would they fund one. So most people couldn't apply every year unless you were me because I would, uh, if it was the music year, I would apply as a composer or as a live music performer. performer. Um, and if it was the film and video media art year, I would apply as a media artist. And I felt that I could do that because sound art is seen as, sound art in a way is our sort of stepping stone into the visual art world because sound art is seen as a media art and is something that is often curated by visual art museums. And so I would apply one year to make a sound, uh, a sound work, which could just be like a fixed media radio piece or something, or a sound installation. And then, then or, uh, or later when I started really working more with video, um, I would apply to make a media installation that included video and sound and so on and so forth. And then if it was the music year, I would emphasize the part of it that was about the music. But a lot of times this would all, this could be the same work because my work sort of has all of these things intersecting. Um, so, but I, so I, I guess the best advice I can give is to, I mean, I think you need to be honest about the nature of your work and, and about your capabilities as an artist. But if you feel confident that you can make something, then you just have to find a way to talk about it that will speak to the people who, uh, who you have to appeal to. Um, I can't really give you a whole lot of uh, advice about how to get curated into visual art programs because I've never really sought that out. Like I've never really like approached galleries and said, show my work. Um, my work, it just sort of happened organically that I would, I would be approached by a, ga a, a gallery because they had a program that was kind of interdisciplinary and they would invite me and say, we want you to come and we want you to give a performance, but also could you show a sound piece in this group show that we're having? And, and so, um, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. And I, I think it is a pretty tricky and difficult world to crack if you're not already, if you don't have some connection there. Um, so that's just my honest answer about that. I don't know how to advise you to get into those doors, but in terms of trying to get your work funded or trying to get it programmed by something that you're allowed to apply for, um, there's a lot of wiggle room in, in just thinking about how you write the narrative in your, in your um, grant application. And then the other thing I would say about grant applications and uh, or applications for workshops or residencies or whatever you're trying to get, um, I, I think, uh, I still think after all these years of applying for a lot of things and many times also be sitting on panels for those things, that the single most important part of your application is the work samples. Mm -hmm. And so you need to show work samples that demonstrate to whoever's sitting on that panel that you know how to make good art. And that's, uh, you know, if they don't see anything in your work samples that moves them, then it doesn't matter what you write. You know, so those are the those are the things to think about, and I guess that also leads to another little slight uh, side note about uh, advice, which is that document your work. Always document your work because you're going to need that documentation. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, so much for that question. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I thought I would actually sneak in one myself. Um, I was wondering, Pamela, if you could speak on the collaboration process uh, when working with choreographers versus working with uh, a chamber ensemble, for example, and just what that is like, if you could compare the two a little bit. Um, well, I would say that probably 
this isn't a hundred percent always the case, but in with the case of working with choreographers, usually I'm much more at their beck and call. Like the choreographer usually is the person who's driving the project. They have a concept in mind. I mean, this is choreographers who I'm who have commissioned me to score their pieces. Um, they have a project in mind. They usually have really particular ideas about the duration, about the sometimes about tempo, um, about mood and also content um, in the work. And so the, it, it, it comes as al almost much more of an assignment, which I find interesting and challenging to like be given an assignment to like, I have to conform to these strictures that this person has in mind. Um, when I do works for chamber ensembles, in my, at least in my experience, it's more often been that I'm the person who's driving the, the concept of the work. They usually come to me and say, we want to commission you, make something for us. And it ranges from them participating a little bit in the brainstorming about what the con conceptual thing is about the piece to them just handing it to me and saying, this is us, we're a sextet, we have this many members, this is what we play make something for us. It, maybe they'll say it needs to be no more than 12 minutes long. Or, you know, they might say something like that, but usually they're not dictating to me what the piece needs to be about or how it needs to be. So it's more of a solitary process until I get towards the end. But there have been um, projects that I've made with chamber ensembles where I really involved them. For example, I made something for Eighth Blackbird where, um, I use all of their speaking voices as part of the music. So in order to start the piece, I had to interview all of them. And so, and we, and, and even though it wasn't COVID times, we still had to do it long distance because I was here and they were in Chicago. So um, they hired a recording studio and they made an appointment with me and then they came and then I over, over the phone, I interviewed them and then the recording engineer made a really good recording clean, pristine recordings of all their voices and then sent me the files. And then that's what I used to work with. But they didn't really have much say in like how I was using it or what I was doing with it or even the, the decision to do it that way. That was, that was uh, um, my choice. Um, when I made the piece for uh, Kronos Quartet, um, I met with David Harrington and we talked and he had the idea that he wanted me to make something. He liked the way I work with text. So he wanted me to make something that used speech sounds. And he was really interested in the fact that San Francisco is full of immigrants from all over the world and also from all different parts of the country. And that there are all these different accents and languages spoken here. So it was his idea to make a piece that focuses on that. But then what I did with that was sort of my own, my own choice. Wonderful. Um, well, we we have approached the the end of our session, but I want to extend um, an extreme thank you to you, Pamela Z, for sharing your work and your brilliance with us this evening, um, and to the composers for your insightful questions. Um, it's been a pleasure, and we hope to see you all again next week for the final event in the series with Karen Wong, where she will be speaking about the sound of culture. So that's it for this evening, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Oh, um, somebody says, Allison has one more question for me after I'm finished talking to Yaz. Was that, is that, I just noticed that. Oh, I think that was, that was my choreography question. Ah, oh, so, okay, great. Yeah, so we're good. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right. All right, thank you, right, everyone. Great. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thanks so much, and I'll see you at the meet and greet. Yes. <laughs>